today uh, we are pleased. Merci, Frédéric. <laughs> so today we are pleased to welcome uh, Marc Fleurbet, who is a professor at the uh, Paris School of uh, Economics. Marc uh, works on uh, so social choice theory, well-being, uh, climate policies, and many other things. Uh, is going to, to present uh, a paper on climate policy with uh, progressive revenue uh, recycling. Uh, Mark, if you are agree, we will speak uh, for about uh, 45 minutes and uh, we will have uh, about uh, 15 minutes for our questions at the end. So for all the participants, if you want to ask uh, questions uh, after the presentation of Mark, you, you should raise the digital yellow hand of Zoom huh? and uh, you, will, uh, you will have the floor. So, but now, Mark, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Lionel, and thank you uh, to all the organizers for inviting me. Um, so this is a, a teamwork with a very large team, so I won't uh, list all the co-authors. Uh, it's, it's a very large team. Um, and, and indeed, as you said, it's about uh, recycling the carbon tax. So this is uh, a theme that is uh, rather popular, of course, uh, already in, in climate policy analysis. Um, and um, it's, a, it's, it's a politically sensitive topic um, as well, right? Because um, the uh, carbon tax is uh, often seen as unfair by people. And so the, the yellow vest movement in France, for instance, was, was triggered by, uh, by these considerations of fairness. And so um, this raises a, a sort of a potential dilemma uh, between the protection of the future and including uh, the future poor, uh, especially if uh, climate damages uh, will be particularly uh, harmful to them, and the, uh, the current uh, poor, if I may say, right, those who uh, might not uh, accept the, the additional burden of the carbon tax. Now, uh, the, there is a substantial literature studying the possibilities of, um, of recycling a carbon tax and the possibility of using a carbon tax to uh, seek a double dividend uh, in various ways. Um, but the, the integrated assessment models that look at the optimal uh, decarbonization, uh, decarbonization path or the optimal carbon tax, uh, typically they ignore the recycling of the, of the carbon tax. And, um, and so the project of this paper is to uh, introduce this uh, recycling possibility in a cost-benefit analysis uh, model um, uh, uh, borrowed from, uh, from the Nordhaus tradition, essentially, um, and see uh, if that changes the, the picture regarding uh, the, the outcomes of, uh, of mitigation and, um, and also um, the uh, general outlook for the optimum, uh, the optimum. Um, let me briefly mention uh, as an advertisement for uh, the, uh, the people who can read French. Uh, I have colleagues at uh, PSC, at ENS, who have published uh, something that is uh, quite interesting, uh, a small book on the energy transition um, and the, the zero net emissions objective uh, for France. Uh, so they, they do look a lot at this possibility of recycling and using the carbon tax for social purposes uh, in quite some detail. Now, let me come back to, um, to this paper. Um, so what we uh, do first is to look at the studies that have um, documented the effects of carbon taxation on, um, on the distribution uh, of uh, consumption of living standards in various countries. And we uh, introduce, as I said, we introduce that in an integrated assessment model. Um, and we, we look at uh, the um, consequences for the optimal carbon tax, carbon tax, or carbon tax and uh, mitigation path. Um, and we, we uh, uncover a sort of uh, uh, rather obvious but interesting uh, Laffer curve in the field of uh, decarbonization. Um, we, we would like to mitigate substantially, but if we mitigate too much, that may actually decrease the carbon tax revenues. Um, and so, so there may be a, a trade-off. Um, and as you'll see, this has important consequences for the uh, time, the optimal time uh, path 
of uh, the decarbonization uh, transition. Actually, so I know that you asked questions at the end, but um, I would very much welcome uh, clarification questions along the way, if there are some, if the organizers uh, allow uh, already. Um, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the model we are using. So this is a model that we uh, took from uh, the, the RICE model of no doubt, and we uh, tweaked it a little bit by introducing income quintiles within the 12 regions of RICE. So the, these regions are sometimes countries, as you know, and sometimes a uh, set of countries uh, like the European Union. Um, and what we've done is to introduce <clears throat> income quintiles so as to better depict the uh, inequalities within uh, these regions. So the, the rich poor uh, issue is, um, is, can be addressed to some extent. Of course, quintiles is a rather rough description of inequalities. And we do not do that at the country level for the, for the regions of rice, which are uh, sets of countries. Right? So there are limitations to what we do. In that, in that respect, it is, uh, is still a rather uh, gross, uh, the granularity of our work is, is still rather limited. Um, now, what uh, we have is that uh, if there is no recycling, the um, consumption, so NR in this, um, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my mouse here. Uh, so the, uh, this is the consumption under a no recycling scenario. Uh, for the uh, region I, uh, quintile Q and time T. And so then we have that um, there is the uh, basic uh, average uh, consumption in that region before uh, taxes, damages, and mitigation cost. Um, and there is a share of that that goes to uh, quintile Q. And then we deduct from that the um, damages uh, for which, again, there is damage BIT, which is computed a la, as in rice for the region in period T. And we have to distribute that across the quintiles Q. And so the little d here will uh, describe the, uh, the distribution of damages across quintiles. And we have the same thing for the mitigation cost M. Um, where again, there is the issue of how uh, they are distributed across, uh, across green time. So that determines the consumption. Um, now, when there is a revenue recycling of the tax, um, we get to the equation that is at the, at the bottom of this slide. And where consumption is the no recycling consumption plus a term that reflects the um, uh, tax that is redistributed to uh, the um, uh, to this quintile. We assume in our analysis here, uh, except for a few variants, but we, we generally assume that the recycling is done just simply as a lump sum redistribution per capita across uh, across all income groups, um, and this will be uh, therefore proportional to the uh, tax and the emissions of the quintile. And, the, um, and so we assume, so we have the emissions of the region, uh, EIT, and we assume that the uh, distribution of uh, mitigation cost is, uh, is the same as the distribution of tax burden. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's an assumption that we'll keep uh, throughout. And that is actually uh, mentioned here at the beginning of this slide. Um, so what about the distribution of damages and mitigation cost and, and tax? So DIQT uh, is, um, we assume that it is related to the uh, distribution of income across uh, quintiles. So SIQT, remember, was the share of income, um, of consumption, actually. Um, and, uh, and XI, this uh, parameter, will describe how um, it's essentially the elasticity of damages to income in the distribution within a region. We assume uh, throughout that we have the same elasticity in all the regions. And likewise, uh, for mitigation and for tax, the tax burden, we have um, another parameter which describes the, uh, the elasticity. 
Um, so uh, in the central uh, scenarios, we assume that the um, psi parameter, the distribution of damages, is equal to one, meaning that damages are uh, proportional to income. And then we look at what happens when they are actually distributed in a regressive way, uh, harming the poor more than the rich in proportion to their, to their um, income um, or their consumption. And, um, and, and for omega, uh, we do some uh, empirical analysis based on the literature. So, um, so for, indeed, uh, many studies have studied the, the impact of um, a carbon tax or a gasoline tax on um, the different uh, income groups in, in various countries. And what we have done is a meta-analysis looking at uh, the main um, studies that uh, provided an estimate of this elasticity. And we try to um, regress these estimates and to link them to the level of development of the country. So YK at the bottom of this slide is the uh, GDP per capita of the, of the country. And so here is what we get. Um, so unfortunately, of course, the estimates are uh, quite uh, spread in a large way, but there is a clear tendency which uh, captures the well-known um, fact that uh, the, um, the distribution of uh, emissions is, um, uh, is, is rather um, uh, more concentrated among the poor in percentage of income in the rich countries and among the rich in poor countries. Right? And so that implies that the elasticity is uh, greater than one in poor countries and decreases with the level of development of, of the country. Um, so we uh, do this simple uh, regression here and, um, and we use that for uh, projections uh, over the future that gives us the uh, omega parameter that we assume to hold. There is, of course, a difficulty, which is we have a growth model in, um, in the scenarios, right, that we study. And, uh, and growth means that the countries uh, will move outside this uh, graph uh, toward the right. Um, and therefore, there is a problem of uh, extrapolation beyond the range of this graph. Uh, I'll say a couple of words about that later on. Okay, so um, if there is no question at this stage, is there any question perhaps of clarification or anything? At the end of your presentation, Mark. Okay, <laughs> okay, Lionel, you are very strict on your policy. All right, so um, the, uh, we first uh, look at a two degree uh, path and, um, and study how the uh, recycling policy uh, impacts the distribution compared to a business as usual uh, scenario. And what we find, uh, which is not surprising and is very much in line with the literature, is that indeed uh, that can um, have good results in terms of social impacts with some regional uh, differences. So maybe I'll go a little quick on that, but um, on the left-hand side, uh, you have the um, uh, change in the consumption of the poorest quintile in the 12 regions that we have in the model. Uh, and that's the change compared to the business for business as usual scenario. And on the left-hand side with, without recycling and on the right-hand side with recycling. And so what you see is that um, there is a difference for the uh, first two thirds of the timeline that is uh, looked at here. Um, depends on the countries, but, um, but, what, but clearly uh, the poorest quintile is much better off uh, under recycling uh, than without recycling. Um, in absence of recycling, there is the typical um, pattern of uh, sacrifice imposed on the first generations and the uh, benefits uh, occurring quite later in the, in the next century. Um, with the recycling, we have something that is um, rather interesting because there is a an immediate benefit thanks to recycling, but then the benefit tends to be reduced when the recycling revenues are themselves reduced when emissions decrease, right? So that's a consequence of this latter effect in a way. Um, and, um, and then we, uh, we catch up with the uh, path 
uh, that we have in absence of recycling once we have uh, decarbonized in various camps. Um, here is a description of what happens in um, uh, three countries uh, where you see the path of consumption for uh, five uh, quintiles. And again, it's expressed in change, uh, in percentage changes with respect to the business as usual scenario. Um, so in the US, um, we see that in the beginning, the first uh, two quintiles, even the first three quintiles uh, tend to benefit. Uh, but, um, but the richest, the two richest countries, the quintiles um, suffer um, in the traditional uh, way. China is actually uh, rather similar uh, in this in the um, uh, in, in this uh, in this slide uh, in this in this respect um, to to the U.S. India is uh, somewhat different uh, because then we see that for some um, quintiles actually there is no no time at which they are worse off uh, than in the business as usual. Right? So so these differences are interesting. Uh, we don't have exactly the same. Uh, timeline and the same pattern in various uh, countries. Um, we can uh, do the same analysis in terms of inequalities, and we retrieve uh, the same pattern, um, except that um, without recycling, we see that uh, inequalities tend to increase or decrease uh, depending on the regions. And this has to do with the fact that uh, <clears throat> mitigation policies, as I said, are um, regressive in rich countries and uh, rather progressive uh, in poor countries. Uh, but with recycling, uh, inequalities decrease uh, initially. Right? Um, we see that even with recycling, inequalities tend to be slightly above. So I hope you can see one is the top line uh, on the right hand side here. Um, they are slightly above. And that's because the countries, uh, as they develop, they reach the point where the mitigation costs are distributed in a, in a regressive way. So inequality increases a little bit. I mean, it's very small. It's, a, it's negligible, but, um, but that explains what happens. Um, and again, we can uh, look at uh, the, the social welfare function that we have in our model, which is very much like the Northern social welfare function. So a standard um, kind of discounted utilitarian uh, function. Um, and the parameters that we use for pure time preference is uh, in the central scenarios 1.5 and for inequality aversion also 1.5. Um, and so we see that um, uh, here the bashed curves correspond to the case in which you have uh, no recycling and the solid curves, the case in which you have recycling. So the same pattern, social welfare is much improved uh, in the beginning. Uh, by the recycling uh, policy. But social welfare, because we have substantial inequality aversion in the, um, because of the inequality aversion parameter of 1.5, uh, this is clearly a consequence of, of that. So it's quite, uh, quite me mechanical. So I'd like to now move on to uh, the question of the optimal mitigation policy. So, so far I've just looked at a, a scenario which imposed a two degree Celsius uh, uh, pattern, uh, outcome. Um, and now uh, let's look at what happens if, if we can really do uh, what is optimal for the social welfare function that we have here. And as I said, um, there is this uh, latter effect. If we tax uh, carbon too much, uh, the, um, uh, the possibility of recycling the revenue is, uh, is decreased. And that implies something that is uh, perhaps uh, really uh, the, the most relevant uh, insight from this paper, um, which is that um, since we have this social co-benefit of recycling the carbon tax, uh, we should um, actually uh, change with respect to the standard pathway, we should change um, the uh, speed of decarbonization by uh, doing more now and uh, delaying the, uh, the, the horizon, delaying the, the delaying the time at which we fully decarbonize in order to enjoy the social benefits a little longer, right? And so that is something that I, I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, this is first, this first one is, is simply uh, just an illustration of this Laffer curve for um, a year that's 2025 in the model, but okay. So depending on, on how you decarbonize uh, and, and that depends on the, um, the, the tax, so this is a model in which 
you could, if you wanted to, uh, you could fully decarbonize in 2025. So of course, this is not uh, realistic, uh, but there are no adjustment costs in this model. Um, and so this is one, one limitation of this model, right? So um, it's not very realistic, but it is not a typical feature of, uh, of the optimal scenarios, um, but we could, right? And so it, in that case, um, we see that uh, the, the, uh, the maximum uh, tax revenue with the carbon tax is, um, is actually for a substantial level of decarbonization, more than 50% uh, for, for a very short horizon. But now let's look at the whole path. And so on the left-hand side here, you have the, um, uh, the decarbonization uh, rate at the global level for uh, various, uh, various uh, approaches. So in uh, blue, you have the case in which we recycle, and that has to be compared with the red where there is no recycling. So the red path is the standard one. Um, so remember, we are in a Nordhaus model, so the decarbonization happens a little late compared to other um, prescriptions that we hear more often now. Um, but what is interesting is the qualitative fact that uh, if we recycle, actually, we would like to decarbonize much more aggressively in the beginning, but we would uh, finish the decarbonization process uh, a little later, right? And that is um, really because of this co-benefit. Um, in the, the dashed uh, curve corresponds to the case in which we would um, only have the social co-benefit and we would have no climate benefit. That would be the case in which there are no climate damages. And so in that case, uh, there would be something a little similar in the beginning. Um, and that is uh, meaningful because in the beginning there are no uh, climate benefits. Um, but the, the two curves, uh, the blue curve and the dashed curve uh, diverge when the climate benefits uh, kick in and we never uh, fully decarbonize uh, in absence of damages. And so on the right hand side, you see what happens for temperature. And um, what's interesting is that because the, um, uh, the uh, mitigation effort is much more ambitious in the beginning, that slows down the pace of, uh, of the increase in temperature. Uh, and so there is a, a slower speed of climate change. Uh, which may have other benefits. Um, uh, and, and so for instance, um, it has been argued that um, it could be good as well for biodiversity because uh, species could adapt uh, more easily if uh, climate change was less uh, rapid. So here we find uh, this kind of result simply because of this uh, different timeline due to uh, social uh, co-benefits. Um, this uh, just describes, so I've, I've looked at um, the decarbonization path. Uh, this is the pattern of the carbon tax itself. Um, and we assume uh, that we have a global carbon tax in this model uh, that is imposed to all regions in the, in the same way. Um, and so the, uh, the blue and the um, now the red is actually the one that was prevailing in the two degree scenario. Uh, the no recycling one is the blue and the recycling one is the, um, is the dark, the, the black, uh, same pattern, right? So the carbon tax should be much higher in the beginning, and, uh, but would, would remain at the same level for quite a long time before we fully decarbonize. Okay, um, then uh, there are a few um, variants that we can uh, look at. One is, um, as I said, the main assumption uh, assumes that the Xi parameter that uh, governs the distribution of damages across, uh, across income quintiles within the regions of rice um, is, is one. Uh, and we can introduce variants where it is less than one. Uh, the extreme that we consider here is uh, when it goes to minus one, which corresponds to a situation in which the share in climate damages is inversely proportional to, um, to people's uh, consumption. Um, so what we see, I hope you can, can see some of these curves. So the, the solid curves are those that correspond to the various assumptions. Um, and so the, the black one at the, at the bottom here is the one that we had in the previous uh, slide. And we see that when we increase the regressivity of climate damages, um, the effort should be uh, higher. So we should decarbonize more quickly. Um, 
There is also an issue of uh, whether we can trust the estimates of damages uh, in, uh, in rice. Um, this is, of course, something that is uh, now being discussed very much, and uh, these uh, damage functions should be revised. But um, uh, it turns out that um, we can connect uh, what we have for different values of the Xi parameter with, with what we would do if we double the climate damages. Uh, so we just simply multiply the climate fun the damage function by two in the, uh, in the model. Uh, and that's the green uh, curve that we, which we have here and which gives us the same, um, the same path of decarbonization as uh, what we would have if the Xi parameter was equal to 0.5. Um, I, I don't really have a clue about what is the right value for the Xi parameter. Uh, the empirical evidence is still uh, missing, but it's, um, it's probably um, below, around or below 0 0.5. Um, we can, of course, um, question the assumption that recycling uh, it operates perfectly and look at what happens when uh, there is um, leakage in the process, for instance, there is administrative cost, or there is some um, inefficiency, some dead weight uh, loss in the process itself. Um, and there can be, so mitigation cost actually already partly uh, captures some dead weight losses of, uh, of, of, mitigation, F, of mitigation policies, uh, but nevertheless, we could assume that there are extra costs. And so if we do that, obviously um, that uh, changes the picture. Uh, and it's, it's interesting perhaps that um, the, um, the situation in which we have no revenue going to the bottom quintile, right? So the bottom quintile is just uh, ignored in the redistribution, um, gives us something that is actually the closest to uh, what we would have without recycling. So that's the green curve that we have in this graph. Um, and the dashed curve is the, the uh, baseline when we have no, uh, no recycling. Um, okay, um, we can also uh, question the uh, projections of uh, future inequality. So in the baseline, we assume that the shares of consumption uh, of the various income quintiles within the regions are remain the same forever. Okay, there is no change in this respect. Um, and of course, uh, this is uh, probably questionable. And so we've looked at uh, a few variants, uh, some coming from the SSPs and some um, just uh, tweaking the level of uh, inequality. And so what we obtain, uh, which is not much surprising, is that if we assume that inequality increases, that reinforces our qualitative finding that we should decarbonize for a longer time, but more aggressively in the beginning. And conversely, if uh, we assume that there are um, that inequalities are actually uh, lower in, in the future. Okay, I guess I can uh, click on that. Um, another question we could ask is uh, this uh, recycling is assumed to operate um, at the regional level uh, of the regions of rice. So um, this is, of course, a, a mixed bag because we have um, some. Um, regions correspond to countries like China and the USA. Other regions correspond to sets of countries. And so assuming that recycling occurs, redistribution occurs within these sets of countries is uh, perhaps um, a bit ambitious, um, but we can go to the uh, extreme of assuming that recycling occurs at the global level. We cannot do, unfortunately, the other extreme, which would be to assume that um, recycling would occur only at the country level because we don't have uh, that in the, in the model. But we can easily uh, simulate what happens when we would have recycling uh, globally. And, um, and so we can assume that it is done completely or that it is done to some extent with some percentage done regionally, some percentage done uh, globally. And so here you see uh, on the left-hand side, the recycling, the, sorry, the decarbonization path. Um, so we would do more if redistribution occurred globally. And that makes a lot of sense, of course, because um, this uh, is much better for social welfare, our global social welfare function, um, since that uh, implies uh, redistribution going to the very poorest uh, in the world. 
And this is especially true for the case in which 100% uh, of the tax revenue is uh, globally redistributed. So that's the green curve. Um, but the, the path is, is not quantitatively extremely different from what we would have uh, otherwise. Um, but nevertheless, uh, since we um, do a little more, but just a little more in the beginning of mitigation method, but uh, then uh, less for a prolonged period of time in the future, uh, we see that the uh, ultimate temperature uh, ends up being uh, somewhat higher due to, uh, to that. So there could be a sort of trade-off between between the social benefit and, uh, and the climate um, imperative. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, as I said, we have this issue of uh, the estimation of the omega elasticity, right? So the distribution of, of the, the carbon uh, tax burden across quintiles um, and mitigation um, effort uh, across quintiles. Um, and so we've done a few variants looking at various um, uh, estimates based on a certain uh, subset of the uh, literature that we've looked at. Um, and also we've looked at what happens if we assume that the, um, and so that's what you see with the dashed um, horizontal segment of line uh, on the left-hand side here, um, we've assumed that the um, omega parameter doesn't go down indefinitely uh, and it stops, it stabilizes at this level uh, in the future. And so when countries develop and reach that level, the omega parameter uh, remains uh, stable. So the impact <clears throat> on the main uh, result in terms of the decarbonization path um, is, um, is not huge. Uh, we don't see much uh, happening uh, in this respect. Okay, so uh, I think I've been pretty good in terms of time, uh, as I was hoping. So um, this um, is a paper in which we've uh, not only confirmed the, the known result that uh, recycling the carbon tax can um, lead the poorest quintiles to actually benefit, at least in the beginning from the policy. Uh, so we've shown some uh, differences across uh, regions, but nevertheless a substantial effect for a few uh, decades. Um, but as I said, um, what I, I particularly uh, find interesting in this kind of analysis is the fact that the time path of decarbonization um, should be optimized. And so uh, even if we keep the temperature objective uh, constant, we can discuss uh, the spread of the effort over time. And somehow it is perhaps a pity that um, the political debates have uh, focused on two degrees Celsius or 1.5 um, first, that may be okay. But then uh, they have quickly moved to, um, to dates of zero net emissions uh, like 2050 or 2055. Um, and, and this uh, is leap to a particular objective in terms of the date for full decarbonization um, may have been a bit hasty. Uh, so it's probably too late to reopen the political debate. Uh, and maybe we shouldn't, uh, it may be a bit dangerous to air the message that actually it's too early to decarbonize, we should decarbonize, we should fully decarbonize uh, later than that. Because the other part of the message, which, will, which is that we should do much more uh, in the first decades is uh, likely to be forgotten. Um, so um, that's where we are, right? So it, it's a bit of a pity that uh, some political debates come to conclusions uh, too quickly, um, but, um, but that's uh, the typical situation. So thank you uh, very much for your attention. And now we have plenty of time for, for discussion. Okay, thanks, Max. Thanks for your presentation. So we have uh, more than 20 minutes for the, for the questions. Uh, if you want to ask questions, and you, you just have to raise the yellow Zoom uh, hand. Uh, I can start. Uh, Mark, I, I don't really understand in your slide um, 16, uh, sorry, <laughs> in slide 16, where, uh, where it shows uh, optimal, uh, the optimal tax. And I don't understand why the optimal tax is uh, significantly uh, lower uh, with the recycling over a long period, while the global decarbonation rate is greater 
with recycling. You, you see? Um, uh, actually, no, what we see, I mean, I could show the slide again, but, but it's very similar to um, what we have with the decarbonization path. The yeah. tax is actually much higher in the first decade when we recycle. So, so really, we have to do a lot more effort in the beginning. And it's only uh, after, I don't remember exactly when, but some, some time at the end of the century that uh, the tax is lower than in absence of recycling. Okay. So it's not as if it was uh, more or less uh, lower everywhere. It's, uh, it's actually much higher in the beginning. Oh, I, I don't see that on, on the slide, but... Uh, okay. well, oh, really? Okay, so let yeah. me try to show it again. Yeah? Uh, perhaps it's a mistake from me. <laughs> Okay, okay, yes, where is that? Slide 16, if you... Yes. Uh, yes, that's it. Yes, this one. Yeah, okay. So, so yes, with, with recycling. Ah, you sorry, uh, if I do that, it can go back there. Uh, no, that was the optimal thing. Too quick. This is it. One. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you see the, the ah, okay, yes, the I black one. It. Yeah, yes, okay, right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so right. I, I realized when I presented yeah. that the change of colors compared to the previous slide was misleading. So it's, it's okay, okay, so yes, yeah. yes. Thanks. Um, there is a question from uh, Bjorn Sorger. Don't wait, yes. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark, uh, for the great presentation. I'm really looking forward to seeing this paper also in the literature. I have a quick comment and then a question also. So uh, the comment, what, what you showed for the two degree policy scenario, I think that matches also with what we found in a similar exercise with Riemann Magpie. Um, with, I think, one difference, we actually found that um, not all countries or regions um, can just from their own domestic revenues get a poverty co-benefit. Uh, co so um, we found that Sub-Saharan Africa even with national recycling, wouldn't be able to do that. And I think the reason is that we take into account the effect on food prices. So if you yeah. believe the IM analysis um, that suggests to do a certain part of the mitigation on the land use side, then you will have this increase in food prices, which will be very regressive. So I think that's an important channel to take into account. Um, and the, the question is actually on your, on your optimal policy. So mathematically, the result makes perfect sense to me that your um, social planner would like to keep the revenues as long as possible to have them for the re redistribution. But at the same time, I wonder whether it's not a bit of an artificial situation, because basically you're assuming that you can only address inequality through climate policy. And of course, in the real world, the pol uh, policymakers have many options to address inequality. Um, so that's why I don't necessarily follow your conclusion that uh, we should perhaps rethink the timing of, of decarbonization. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Bjorn. Um, on your comments, yes, that's a very good point. So we have a very crude model, as you know, and we don't describe, uh, there is no general equilibrium effect in, in this uh, type of model. Another feature maybe is that um, Africa is a, is a region, uh, except for the Northern Africa, but we have South Africa in, the, um, in, in Africa, right? And so, uh, it's, it's different from uh, uh, keeping uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, I guess that excludes, in your case, that excludes South, uh, South Africa, right? No, I think South Africa for us is um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which ah, okay. is not, not, not an ideal choice um, okay. All right. from yeah. an economic perspective. Okay. Um, but so I think the main driver is probably whether you have the food prices and not so much the, the regional. Um, okay, okay, yeah, well, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so, uh, you're right uh, that we could imagine, uh, I mean, <laughs> we, uh, we could press uh, governments to do more with other tools. Um, nevertheless, um, I'm, I'm no politician, but there is an interesting issue there in terms of the, the political economy of the instruments, right? And um, if the acceptability of the uh, carbon tax policy requires something like the carbon dividend, um, that will have an impact, right? So imagine that I can tell something about France, right? If, we in, if in France, we were to say, we will reform the income tax in this way or that way, and, um, and we will do a carbon tax, uh, that will be um, 
extremely difficult, uh, almost impossible to imagine. Um, and so what happens rather is if we want to introduce a carbon tax, it has to be a company with social measures. And actually even in France, uh, even doing that would not convince many people that it is still fair. Um, but, uh, but in principle, we could imagine uh, this kind of conversation because it would be a package that would be very clearly identified. Whereas uh, changing, the, uh, changing either the foreign aid policy in the case of global redistribution or the uh, standard uh, tax, um, uh, income taxes and, and uh, wealth taxes um, at, at the domestic level, um, this may be, may be difficult. So I think there is room for a discussion of, uh, of these uh, environmental policies that considers, it's an extreme assumption, I agree, that considers that the other redistributive instruments are essentially politically frozen and we cannot really change them. Um, so of course, it's an extreme assumption. The other extreme assumption that they are optimally set and totally flexible is, uh, is I think much more unrealistic. The truth is in between. Um, but, uh, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a scenario that's worth, um, that's worth looking at. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hmm. Thanks. Now there is a question from uh, Jean-Christophe Perrault. Yes, but it was just a, 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 a clarification, please. Uh, you say that recycling was inside regions, but your tax is a global one. It's the same for all the countries or not? That's the point, I, it's not clear for me. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, that's right. Uh, so we assume that the level of the tax is the same everywhere, uh, but the tax is collected regionally and redistributed regionally. That's right. So um, actually, we could, we could, and we haven't done it in this paper, we could uh, uh, look at what happens if we allow for uh, different, different, different levels of the carbon tax in different countries. Um, um, yeah, that's... Um, and I, actually, it's an interesting thing that we should perhaps pursue further uh, because um, that connects to the point that was made by Bjorn before. Um, typically, when we introduce the possibility of having different taxes, what we obtain is uh, high taxes in rich countries and lower taxes in poor countries. Um, and so that, uh, that interferes with the uh, social benefits uh, for the very poorest. Um, so yeah, that would be an interesting um, uh, extension. Thank you. I don't see uh, other. Uh, Bruno. Good evening from India. Uh, thank you very much for. You can hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I look also to 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 read this paper i like uh, of course the uh, general idea and uh, the way how recycling can uh, decrease uh, inequality uh, now i have a two question first uh, very small question is um, uh, in one of the, your first slides i don't remember the name the number uh, you show a different behavior of uh, India compared to China and others and OECD country, let's say. Uh, do you have any explanation? It's, uh, I guess it's linked to your assumption or to specific parameters. So if you have any explanation of this different behavior, I'd be happy to, to understand them. And uh, the second question is, um, uh, I think like the odds that uh, uh, especially a uniform tax uh, or a tax uh, would be disaster in a country like India, especially for the farmer and also the consumer, especially uh, for, uh, for the food production and the food consumption, because uh, in India you have a high system of uh, important system of subsidy uh, for industrial agriculture, uh, very uh, energy, fossil energy dependent. And uh, this is exactly what's happening <laughs> to the, uh, since now almost one year with the farmer, uh, Punjab farmer, or Ariana, or West UP um, farm, farmer, where there was some reform, not to for ecological point of view, but for uh, for uh, removing some of this subsidy, input subsidy, etc. So I think it will be uh, uh, quite regressive uh, this kind of tax. 
Uh, now, what would, how you model will behave is instead of a tax, or did you test it that? You have uh, some kind of payment for environmental services, not by hectare, but by farmer, who are, who are uh, you know, 45% of the active population in India is still in agriculture, and they are the poorest, and much uh, lower, uh, a large income gap with, with non-farmer. So imagine you have, instead of a tax, you have a payment for environmental services, especially to to carbon sequestration, soil organic carbon sequestration. I'm quite sure it will increase a lot of farming, farmers' income, especially the micro farmer. And the average size of the farm in India is one hectare. And if you pay per, per, per farmer and not per hectare, you can increase a lot. And you can definitely store a lot of uh, carbon in the soil and then mitigate uh, hugely uh, the global climate change. So we can imagine some international payment for that. Uh, how you, you, your model uh, is able to capture that and to see, of course, this carbon sequestration will, will uh, the duration will be, uh, let's say, 20, 30 years. So after that, the benefit won't be there, the climate benefit. But how your model is able to capture such uh, uh, other measures than uh, tax, and especially uh, ca uh, carbon, also organic carbon sequestration. Okay, yeah, um, thank you very much, Bruno. So um, I know I don't have a particular um, insight about what happens in India. Indeed, it depends on, on all the, the parameters of the model, the level of inequality, and the level, the path of decarbonization. Um, and so there may be things um, having to do with the mitigation cost also in India. Um, so uh, yeah, um, uh, we, should, we should perhaps uh, look more in the details, but I don't remember um, uh, anything right on the top of my, my mind about, um, about that special case of India. Um, so when you say that the, uh, the tax imposed on the population would be disastrous, I agree. Uh, I'm not sure it would be regressive in, in the sense of inequalities, but we it would be um, a disastrous in terms of poverty. Right? And, and that's, that's indeed a feature that is important for developing countries. So the, the tax can reduce inequalities and increase poverty at the same time. Um, and that's typically the case with the carbon tax for, for developing countries. So you, you're right, this is a serious problem. And our, um, our analysis is, um, is perhaps not capturing enough uh, some detailed aspects of poverty uh, linked to, for instance, as uh, Bjorn said, food prices and this sort of thing, right? So, so this is not something that we, we capture very well. Um, now, uh, would it be able to introduce subsidies for environmental services like carbon sequestration? Uh, probably not in a detailed way. Uh, because we don't have anything like um, uh, sectors in the model. This is a purely macro uh, macroeconomic model. And um, we could imagine subsidies for, I think we could imagine subsidies for carbon sequestration described in a very kind of black box way. Uh, that, that could be done. Um, but I'm not sure uh, we could do it in a way that would uh, be sufficiently realistic, but but yeah, in principle, uh, some simple, very stylized way of incorporating such policies um, would work. Uh, so as I understand, um, in, in the scenario you have in mind, that would be, um, these subsidies would be distributed in a way that would be highly progressive because they would go a lot to uh, farmers um, and a lot to, to farmers with low income. Um, so if that's the case, that would be uh, that would be interesting. But that, that would be an additional instrument, and that would be something that would play a role both for uh, the level of net emissions and for um, and for the distribution. Um, yeah. So I guess it's it's doable, um, but um, not necessarily easy to calibrate. To calibrate such things, maybe you can use uh, also have a look on the maybe you heard uh, the four per thousand initiative. You heard about it, I guess, and you. A lot of literature has been produced, so it may help to parameter the model. Ah, yes, okay, thanks, yeah. Okay, we have time for uh, another question. Last one. Yes, Marita. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Lionel. I just wanted to comment uh, on, on this discussion that uh, we had a, a little back after another comment and a question about the uh, other ways of uh, redistributing. Um, and I think there is some empirical literature that finds that uh, people just don't really get it uh, if, if you try to um, sort of um, complement carbon taxes with uh, cuts in other taxes. So it, that would kind of back your argument about um, it probably being, being necessary to address um, address uh, redistribution through through uh, recycling the carbon taxes as well. Uh, and I would say anecdotally also seems to really be the case in, um, in Finland where we have pretty high carbon taxes and it's just even the media can't make the link because a media article is either about carbon taxes or income taxes and they just don't seem to be able to write about the two at the same time at all. So our current government uh, actually cut income taxes in exchange for um, increasing uh, carbon taxes, but nobody knows about it unless they, they read all the government documents because journalists don't get it. Uh, but in addition to that anecdote, there, there seem to be empirical studies about that uh, phenomenon as well. Yeah, thank you, Marita. Yes, you, you're probably right. And um, it must be true in other countries as well. Actually, um, there has been a survey done in France that is um, even more depressing because it um, people have been asked if they would support a carbon tax under different uh, accommodation. And, um, and so if they are uh, presented the possibility of uh, redistributing a carbon dividend to everyone equally, uh, that doesn't really change very much their support for the carbon tax compared to a carbon tax without any uh, without any um, uh, accommodation. Um, the only way to assuage their uh, reluctance uh, for carbon tax is by uh, by using the, the tax revenue is expressly uh, specifically for environmental investment. Uh, that's the only way in which people seem to um, to, to change their mind about the carbon tax. So if we say this will be invested in research on green energy, they are much more favorable than if this is redistributed as a check to everyone. Um, so it looks like, uh, uh, you know, the behavioral studies showing that people have mental accounting in their mind and different accounts for different, um, different uh, uses of their money, depending on the source of the money. Um, so it looks like there is something happening as well. So there is the environmental um, silo, so to speak. And so if you uh, tax environmental practices, the proceeds have to be used for environmental purposes. I don't know if, if other countries have similar results, but that's, that seems to be the situation in France. OK. We have time for the last question. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> no other question? Okay, so we, we can stop now. Uh, thanks again, Mark, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And um, just um, some words about the next presentation. In, in two weeks, uh, Imelda from the Graduate Institute uh, of Geneva will uh, talk about uh, clean energy access and the questions of uh, gender uh, disparity. So uh, thanks again for uh, to Mark. Thank you very much uh, to you all. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, we will see you uh, in two weeks. Mark, uh, stay with us. Huh? <laughs> you can stay with us. Huh? Just one or two minutes. Bye-bye. On fait, on, je t'embête pas longtemps, Marc, on fait juste un petit point, généralement de deux, une minute ou deux. Hein, et, euh... Eric, you can stop. Euh... Merci, Marc.